settling into your body and whatever posture of relative stillness is available to you, is comfortable for you, is supportive for you. And that might mean that there's movement involved, like caring for yourself and asking in, asking into the body to discern. For this practice of mindfulness, this practice of awareness, Sati, we translate as mindfulness or awareness. It's available in any posture, in any environment, in any moment. And so it's helpful when we have the opportunity for a quote unquote formal practice of sati. It's helpful to to do what we can so that we are alert and awake and we have comfort and ease in the body both to create the conditions to support the cultivation of sati and as we do this we find that it's available in our lived experience as many of you named in different ways with our experience of the technology. It's not perfect. Nothing's perfect. And when we are able to rest into things as they are, to be present to them, to be aware of our response, this is sati. We find more ease and we're able to navigate life. And so we practice, quote unquote, on the cushion so that we can be present to life as it's unfolding and to ourselves. So that we can navigate life. Whether it's a missed flight or it's technology or it's someone else behaving some way other than you would prefer. Mm. We're able to be with it. We're able to be with ourselves. And so just in case this wasn't super clear, I'm wanting to point out that right now we're creating a container and an environment and space so that we can have some kind of settling and spaciousness. Not because that's right or better or what we need, but as a support so that settling and spaciousness is available amidst any kind of environment. And practicing here at the collective, we often have lots of different things to practice with in the form of sound, which can be great support <clears throat> to drop into presence. Whether it's the sound of a neighbor next to you or upstairs or the sound of someone outside. Those sounds call us back to the moment. They pull us out of that ruminating mind. They're like a wake up bell, like the church bells that we pause to enjoy. They can bring us home to ourselves. So allowing your practice to be supported. As you settle into your posture, and you might rest, rest into a broad awareness if that's supportive for you, allowing the words that I'm going to offer arise and pass like waves on the ocean, not tending to their content at all. Or tending to the content of what I'll offer and allowing that to support you. Maybe it's something in between. This is your practice. I'm here as a guide, not to tell you what you should do, but to offer a possibility. Please do as your own heart guides you.
uh, for some words from Thich Nhat Hanh, from Plum Village. Standard, basic, guided meditation practice. Breathing in. I am aware that I'm breathing in. Breathing out. I am aware that I am breathing out. In, out. Breathing in, I am aware of the whole length of the in-breath. Breathing out, I am aware of the whole length of the out-breath. Hold length.
Breathing in. I am aware of the entire in-breath. Beginning, middle, and end. Breathing out, I am aware of the entire outbreath. Beginning, middle, and end. Entire breath. Breathing in, noticing there's a gentle pause between the in-breath and the out-breath. Breathing out, noticing there's a gentle pause between the out-breath and the in-breath. Noticing, pause,
Noticing the quality of the breath. Observing as we breathe in. Perhaps the breath has deepened. Observing the quality of the breath. As we breathe out, perhaps the breath has slowed down. Deep. Slow. Breathing in, observing the quality of the heart. Perhaps there's a little bit of calm. Breathing out, observing the quality of the heart. Perhaps there's a little bit of ease. Maybe not, it's all good. Observing, calm, Observing ease.
As Thich Nhat Hanh taught, sometimes a smile can be the source of our happiness. And sometimes a smile is the result of our happiness. Actively bringing a little smile onto the face. The smile of the Buddha, one who knows, one who is awake. And observing if this little smile invites the body, the heart, the mind to release, to relax and let go. Smile, release. Resting into awareness of the breath, body, sound, whatever's most supportive for you, enjoying some relative silence together for a little while. Mindfulness does not care what it is mindful of.
Mindfulness is always mindfulness of something. Gradually, gradually expanding the field of awareness, doing some movements, really giving the fullness of your attention to this experience of movement and listening in to the wisdom of your own heart and body to discern what movement is helpful for you right now. Small stretches, big stretches, a little soft massage, maybe you want to stand up. Listen in, ask, listen, and then act. And we ask in and then we listen and we act from that wisdom. And as you're ready, expanding into sight. Whatever level of sightedness you might have, whatever level of movement might be available to you. And as you're able, noticing how the heart, mind, and body respond, continuing our practice of mindfulness, right? not limiting it to, not limiting it to our formal practice. My preference in teaching is to be very responsive. And I was asked a request was made of me recently, a question arose, and I feel inspired to offer this sutta as a response to that. So keep your questions coming. So you might rest into your body in whatever way is comfortable for you. You can keep your eyes on me if you like, or you can allow them to close. I will be reading. So whatever works for you, and you can come in and out, uh, tuning in word or engaging with me, whatever works for you. So this is the Dhamma Chaka Pavatana Sutta. And it's from the Samyutta Nikaya, which is written usually with an S and an N if you start to look into the, the suttas or the sutras. Samyutta Nikaya 5611. 
It's often translated as the discourse, which is what sutta or sutra is translated as discourse. It means teaching. Discourse on turning the wheel of the Dhamma or turning the wheel of the Dharma. The discourse on the turning of the wheel of the Dharma, turning the wheel of the Dhamma. And sometimes it's suggested this is the first Dharma talk, first talk that the Buddha gave. I have no idea. That's quite a long time ago. But here we go. This is a translation offered by Thich Nhat Hanh. And one of the things that's special to me about this sutta is that it shows up both in the lineage of Ajahn Chah and in the lineage of Thich Nhat Hanh. So both of the lineages that I really practice in and draw from, it's in both of them. So I love that. So this is the translation from Thai. This is what I have heard. At one time, the world honored one was staying near Vana was staying near Varanasi at Isipatana in the Deer Park. At that time, the world honored one addressed a group of five practitioners. Maybe it's the five practitioners who had told him to go fuck off when he said he was going to have something to eat. I don't know if you know that story about him. Maybe we'll get to it another time, but he was practicing with these, this crew, and they were practicing, they were practicing, they were practicing, they were practicing a lot of asceticism. So they were starving themselves, self mortification, trying to reach enlightenment, like trying to get free. And Buddha was like, I'm not getting free. And you're like, it took him a while, but finally, this isn't working. He said, I'm going to go sit in this tree until I get some freedom. And part of the freedom that he found was the middle way, the middle path. And so when he came upon these mendicants, he shared. At that time, the World Honored One addressed the group of five practitioners, saying, Practitioners, there are two extremes that a practitioner should avoid. Or suggested that you avoid. I'm not really fond of the word should. What are the two? The first is a devotion to sensual desire and the pleasure resulting from sensual desire. Such devotion is base, pedestrian, worldly, ignoble, and unbeneficial. The second is devotion to harsh austerity. Such devotion is painful, ignoble, and unbeneficial. By not following either of these extremes, the Tathagata has realized the middle way that gives rise to seeing and understanding. This seeing and understanding are at the basis of peace, knowledge, full awakening, and nirvana. What is the middle way, practitioners, that the Tathagata has realized that gives rise to seeing and understanding? When that seeing and understanding are at the basis of peace, knowledge, full awakening, and nirvana, it is the noble eight path consisting of right view, right thinking, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right diligence, right mindfulness, right concentration. Well, side note over here. You might know right thinking as right intention. And you might know right diligence as right effort. It's the same thing. This is the way, practitioners, that the Tathagata has realized that gives rise to seeing and understanding when that seeing and understanding are at the basis of peace, knowledge, full awakening, and nirvana. Who doesn't want some of that? Like, I want some peace, knowledge, full awakening, and nirvana. Sounds good. Here, practitioners, is the noble truth of suffering, dukkha. Birth is suffering. Old age is suffering. Sickness is suffering. Death is suffering. Sorrow, grief, mental anguish, and disturbance are suffering. And you may have heard that before. In the Ajahn Chah world, we say, sorrow, grief, lamentation, and despair. So it's a translation of the same thing, right? But these are Thai's words. These are the words that Thich Nhat Hanh offers this in. Sorrow, grief, mental anguish, 
and disturbance are suffering. To be with those you dislike is suffering. To be separated from those you love is suffering. Not having what you long for is suffering. In other words, to grasp the five aggregates, form, feeling, perception, and mental formation, as though they constitute a self, is suffering. In other words, to grasp the five aggregates, the five aggregates, the five heaps, the five skandhas, as though they constitute a self, is suffering. Here, practitioners, is the noble truth of the cause of suffering. It is the desire to be born again, delight in being born again, attached to the pleasures found in this and that. There is the craving for sense pleasures, for becoming and for not becoming anymore. Here, practitioners, is the noble truth of the ending of suffering. It is the fading away and ending of craving without any trace. It is giving up, letting go of, being free from, and doing away with craving. And I want you to know that we all did a little bit of that today when we were navigating technology. We all practice a little bit of letting go of the craving for that technology to work, right? We all experience it collectively. We tasted it. Here, practitioners, is the noble truth of the path that leads to the end of suffering. It is the noble eightfold path of right view, right thinking, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right diligence, right mindfulness, and right concentration. And I have an intention to talk about the eightfold path more. We'll see when it comes up, but I want to say now that this right, that this translation is offering of right mindfulness, right view, right intention. It's not right as in right and wrong. Like that is not what it's about. One time I had a couple of opportunities to be in the presence of Ajahn Amaro and receive teaching from him directly in community. And one of those times he was talking about this word, samma in Pali, samma, that often is translated as right. I, I mentioned the word wise earlier. It's another way that it can be translated. But right, it's about upright, upright, aligned, alert. It's kind of a bougie. I don't know how many of you have had the experience of sailing, but if you have the chance to sail, the, the boat might go like this, you know? And then you upright it. That's it. It's not like it's good or correct or proper. It's just right. You just righted the ship. That's it. That's all you did. And we practice that in our lives to, you know, write our direction. You know, like, I think I said this recently here in the group, but even a plane that's on course is off course 95% of the time. It's adjusting and adjusting and adjusting. And that's the right that we're talking about here, that, that kind of writing. It's like, oh, is it skillful? Is it leading in the direction that I'm wanting to be leading? You know, is it wise? Is it kind? Is it considerate? Is it thoughtful? Like, oh, is it useful? Is it beneficial? You can play with it. but. It's often translated as right, so you get to do your own translating of the word. Practitioners, when I realized the noble truth of suffering, dukkha, seeing, understanding, insight, wisdom, and light arose in me with regard to things I had not heard before. Practitioners, when I realized the noble truth of suffering needs to be understood right, needs to be known. Seeing, understanding, insight, wisdom, and light arose in me with regard to things I had not heard before. Hmm. Monks, when I realized the noble truth of suffering, dukkha, when I realized the noble truth of suffering has been understood, seeing, understanding, insight, wisdom, and light arose in me with regard to things I had not heard before. Another asterisk here. So I mentioned that he'd been practicing with these five, under, five other mendicants in the forest. And the Buddha 
the story goes, again, I wasn't there, I don't know, but he had practiced with many wise teachers of the time. And he had realized the things that they were teaching. And they're like, oh my God, you've got it all. You can lead us now. And he's like, no, I'm searching for freedom. I'm searching for freedom. So in my mind, as I hear this translation from Tai, from Tay, as I hear the translation from Tay, and he says, I had not heard before. It, it touches in me this thing that I understand from the Buddha. as like, he got this wisdom from these other people, but they didn't get to say this because they hadn't realized this. They hadn't experienced freedom from suffering. I said, oh, I haven't heard before. Maybe he's pointing to that. I don't know, but I offer that to you in case it might have some support for you. When I realized the noble truth of the causes of suffering, right? This is the second noble truth. There's a cause of suffering, tanha, thirst, craving. When I realized the noble truth of the causes of suffering, Seeing, understanding, insight, wisdom, and light. Seeing, understanding, insight, wisdom, and light arose in me with regard to things I had not heard before. When I realized that the causes of suffering need to be given up, right? So dukkha needs to be understood or to be known. Tanha, thirst, craving, causes of suffering need to be given up. Seeing, understanding, insight, wisdom, and light arose in me with regard to things I had not heard before. When I realized that the causes of suffering having been given up, seeing, understanding, insight, wisdom, and light arose in me with regard to things I had not heard before. Some of you are familiar with this. For some of you, it's new. In the Plum Village tradition, when a bell sounds, we allow that to be the voice of the Buddha calling us home to ourselves. So a chance to just stop and rest and be like, come home. How are you doing? What's going on? Ask, listen, act, right? What's up? What do you need? How can I care for you? It's a chance to pause. Our lives are so busy and so full of stuff, right? I live right off the J Church line, so that J going by, it's the opportunity to call me home to myself. Sirens are also good for it. And we're next to the church, so we can enjoy the church bells. Mm -hmm. And I'll wrap up shortly. When I realized that the causes of suffering have been given up, seeing, understanding, insight, wisdom, and light arose in me with regard to things I had not heard before. When I realized the noble truths of the ending of suffering, seeing, understanding, insight, wisdom, and light arose in me with regard to things I had not heard before. When I realized that the end of suffering needs to be experienced, right? So known, let go of, and experience if you're tracking. When I realized the end of suffering needs to be experienced, Seeing, understanding, insight, wisdom, and light arose in me with regard to things I had not heard before. When I realized that the ending of suffering has been experienced, seeing, understanding, insight, wisdom, and light arose in me with regard to things I had not heard before. When I realized the noble truth of the path that leads the end of suffering. Seeing, understanding, insight, wisdom, and light arose in me with regard to things I had not heard before. 
right? And that noble truth of the path, that's the Eightfold Path we've listed twice now. When I realize that the path that leads to when I realize that the path that leads to the end of suffering needs to be practiced, that's who following me. The first noble truth is known. The second noble truth craving is let go of. The third noble truth, the cessation of craving is realized. And the fourth noble truth, the path, Maga, the eightfold path is practiced. When I realize that the path that leads to the end of the suffering, the end of suffering needs to be practiced. When I realize that it needs to be practiced, right, that's enough. Seeing, understanding, insight, wisdom, and light arose in me with regard to things I had not heard before. When I realized that the path that leads to the end of suffering has been practiced, seeing, understanding, insight, Wisdom and light arose in me with regard to things I had not heard before. As long as insight and understanding of the four noble truths in their three stages and 12 aspects, three times four equals 12, <laughs> just as they are, had not been realized, as long as insight and understanding of the four noble truths had not been realized, I could not say that in the world with its gods, Maras, Brahmas, recluses, Brahmins, and humans, someone had realized the highest awakening. Practitioners, as soon as insight and understanding of the four noble truths in their three stages and 12 aspects, just as they are, had been realized, I could say, that in this world, with its gods, maras, brahmas, recluses, brahmins, and humans, someone had realized the highest awakening, that understanding and seeing have arisen, that the liberation of my mind is unshakable, that this is my last birth, that there is no more becoming, When the world honored one had spoken thus, the five practitioners rejoiced in their hearts upon hearing the four noble truths, the pure eye that sees the meaning of the teachings without attachment, that's kind of similar to acceptance, without attachment arose in the monk, Kandanya. He realized, they realized, getting rid of the heat, arose in the practitioner, Kandanya, they realize that everything that is of the nature to arise is of the nature to cease. When the Dharma wheel had thus been turned by the world honored one, the earth gods proclaimed near Varanasi at Isipatana in the Deer Park. The highest wheel of the Dharma has been set in motion. It cannot be turned back by recluses, Brahmins, gods, maras, brahmas, or anyone in the world. When the four, when the four regal ones heard that the earth gods' proclamation, they proclaimed near Banasi, at Isipatana, in the Deer Park, the highest wheel of the Dhamma has been set in motion. It cannot be turned back. I'm almost finished, I promise. It cannot be turned back by recluses, Brahmins, gods, maras. Brahmas or anyone in the world. When the gods of the 33rd heaven and the gods of the realm of the dead, the Tushita gods, the gods who rejoice in creation, the gods who have power through control of others, the gods in the company of Brahma heard the four majestic ones' proclamation. They proclaimed near Vanasi at Isipatana in the Deer Park, and the highest wheel of the Dharma has been set in motion. It cannot be turned back. By recluses, Brahmins, gods, Mars, Brahmas, or anyone in the world. At that hour, at that moment, at that instant of time, the proclamation reached the world of Brahma, and the 10,000 world systems shook and shook again. An immeasurable splendor was seen throughout the world, surpassing the splendor of all the gods. Inspired, the world honored one spoke. Indeed, Kundanya 
has understood. Indeed, Kandanya has understood. Thus, thus Kandanya received the name Kandanya, who understands. I offer you this translation from Thich Nhat Hanh of the Dhamma Chaka Pava, Pava, Dhamma Chaka Pavanata Sutta from the Samyutta Nikaya 5611. Samyutta Nikaya 5611, the discourse on turning the wheel of the Dhamma. Thank you for your kind attention. If there's any way that might, might have benefited by offering the Dhamma and practicing together, may it be of benefit to all beings, including ourselves, and may it bring peace. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. We're finished. It's 10 after. I'm really trying to end on time. Didn't happen. Might happen sometime in the future. Who knows? Bye, Julie. Bye, Jan. Lovely to meet you. Welcome, welcome. See you next time, I hope. <laughs>